Okay, welcome. This is the fourth, I believe, the fourth lecture in the um, Process to Synthesis lectures for the junior seminar class. And this lecture is uh, generally just titled Synthesis, um, although sometimes it's a, you got your chocolate and my peanut butter, uh, depending on how I want to title it in different places. And so this lecture is about one of the core concepts of the whole class, which is uh, synthesis. And synthesis can mean a lot of different things. Um, it can mean the, um, the creation of things, and it can mean the combining of things. And generally, in a lot of contexts, it means the creation of things through the combining of things. Um, so if you read this whole first page, you'll learn a little bit about uh, photosynthesis, and you'll learn a little bit about the Hegelian dialectic. Um, and you'll see how these all relate to this lecture. So in this lecture we're going to be talking about why um, the notion of combining things and finding synthesis, why that's useful to you as an individual artist, and why it's relevant to art creation in general, why it's relevant to the whole history of art, as well as why it's specifically relevant to right now um, making art today. Um, and so it has a number of different points uh, that I cover, and so the first thing we're going to be talking about is just kind of like some examples of culture, just kind of trying to point out about how um, one of my main points is that all culture is recycled and recreated and synthesized. There is no such thing as culture that is wholly original. Everything is recombinations of, of older ideas put into new um, packages and often it's because of the power of recombinations because they're both um, familiar in some ways and yet wholly new and satisfying in new ways that they tend to be very successful ideas culturally and then um, and that will also lead to talking about how we see this both within cultures but also through the combination of cultures and then we're going to talk about it within um, artist body of work, and we're going to be talking about it in terms of um, in studio work, like one artist and how they work within their studio. And then lastly, we're going to be talking about it in terms of how it relates to designers and design process. So first of all, I think we're probably all aware of the, the world we live in today, dominated by um, kind of the, you know, the end results of, of meme culture and just of various different kinds of internet platforms and social media that so much of our culture is a constant you know re uh, reprocessing and recombinations of cultural ideas i'm using this particular uh, series of memes based off of a sonic youth lp um, as kind of a evidence of that and i think you know, like oftentimes we look back at culture from, let's say, rock of the 70s, and we see it as being something that just as a product of that, just of that time period. But really, every everything is a product of a number of influences um, going on. So like a good example of that would be like the kind of the reggae rhythm in Hotel California. And reggae itself is a form of synthesis, a combination of cultural ideas, including how um, how Jamaican um, artists interpreted American R&B, and American R&B um, comes out of rhythm and blues, which was itself a form of synthesis. Um, so it just it goes on and on and on. So we're going to look at a number of contemporary artists where I think you can see how they, in their work, they're either bringing a, one or two major influences. Oftentimes especially for these first two examples, they're bringing some outside influences and bringing them into the contemporary, the contemporary and the fine art world. So like with Raymond Pettibon, um, his kind of interest in, in comic book in imagery and coming out of the culture of sort of uh, punk rock magazines, uh, Black Flag and that kind of thing. Or with Walton Ford, where he's you know kind of reinterpreting naturalist illustrations of the 19th century and bringing them into a contemporary art, fine art context. Uh, and that in of itself is a type of synthesis and a type of recombination. Uh, someone like Mariko Mori uh, is, is also kind of like bringing all these sort of 
sci-fi and fantasy influences and turning them into something very fine art based. I think you can see this idea almost more literally with the work of Subodh Gupta because his pieces are literally made up of the combinations of, of objects sometimes, of found objects. Um, I especially like the ones that are made up of, uh, um, you know, cookingware, you know, pots and pans out of, out of people's kitchens. And I, I love his work. I think it's really uh, very impressive, very amazing. And so let's take a little bit of a, a side to talk about the importance of recombination and and just kind of the mixing of different influences and the, the sort of overall collage aesthetic of the 20th century and how that led to the late 20th century and, and the 21st century. Um, part of that comes out of people like the, the Dadaists, like Duchamp, where they're kind of reclaiming and repurposing things for a very kind of conceptual purpose. Part of that comes out of um, artists like Hannah Hawk, where she's using collage as a, a very quick way to make work that is uh, very uh, political, uh, whereas Picasso and Brock were using collage more as a way to bring the everyday into the, the fine art world. And then someone like Joseph Cornell doing that three-dimensionally. Um, and then so here are some examples of contemporary artists who have that similar kind of idea of, of taking various things and re juxtaposing and combining them in surprising, sometimes original ways. Uh, so uh, Elm Green and Drags is a sculpture team. Uh, Tom Friedman um, is a, an American sculptor who, um, in a lot of his work, is often kind of bringing different influences together and recombining various, not also literally the materials themselves as well as the concepts. I love this total box. It's one of my favorite pieces by his, one of my favorite pieces of contemporary sculpture. Um, I wish I had a chance to see it in person. Um, maybe one day it'll be at a museum that I'm attending. Um, and it, I just think it's an amazing thing to, he, you know, he literally built a giant sized total box out of lot, you know, out of cutting up, you know, many, many small or regular sized total boxes. And then the boxes um, create this kind of pixelation effect so that when you photograph it, it looks like your photograph is badly JPEGed. Okay, so let's also talk about it from a different point of view. So earlier we've been talking about artists who are bringing either different cultural ideas or different elements into their artwork. But you can see the same idea sometimes with artists where their own studio process is a series of different ideas, like artists who make this kind of work and that kind of work. And then they try to combine them very at various times. A good example of that would be Gerhard Richter, who throughout his career has been making um, at least three kind of distinctive bodies of work. Um, some paintings that are very much photo reproduction paintings, some works that are um, much more small and informal, like where he would paint directly on top of photographs and, and print and on top of them and then scrape away, and then large abstractions. And of the large abstractions, uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily call these abstractions, maybe large non-objective paintings would be a better example. Um, they kind of, some of them are more abstracted and some are more like these, purely just a process where they're just simply created through the process of scraping the paint. And one of the things that's interesting to me is that all of these though come out of similar ideas. Like these are very much about photographs as in some ways as much about photographs as these are. Um, in that they come out of this kind of process of scraping paint on top of photographs, but they also come out of these sort of abstractions, but these abstractions are also photo-based abstractions. And these are literally abstractions, whereas these are much more non-objective. Okay, that's gonna be end of part one. I think we can probably finish this um, with just a part two.